we understand how central and final a role the sacrifice of Yeshua means for our lives. The book of Hebrews confirms that point when it's written in chapter 10, verse 12, but when Messiah had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And then in verse 14 we read, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. If this is the case, and sacrifices for sins are no longer necessary, why will there be sacrifices in the millennium? Thank you. Well, thank you for this question. This is an often asked question. Why are there sacrifices during the millennium or the messianic times? A time when the Messiah will be present on earth. Didn't Jesus' death and resurrection put an end to the sacrificial system? Yes, his death and resurrection did put an end to the to sacrifices for the believers, but not for the unbelievers. During the millennium, both believers and unbelievers will live side by side, and God graciously reinstated some parts of the sacrificial system so that the unsaved will see the utter depth of sin through these sacrifices. The description of this era concerning the temple and the sacrifices are found mainly in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48. Now considering the prophetic chart as you have on the screen, after the seven year tribulation times, only the believers will enter the messianic era. However, their children, for they will have a lot of children, will have to come to a saving knowledge of Yeshua, for no one is born a believer. So they would need to understand what sin is and there is nothing like the sacrifice of innocent animals to describe the ravages of sin. The fact that Yeshua will be present does not mean that everyone will automatically become to be uh, a believer. In the same way, when he was present on earth 2,000 years ago, after a failed ministry of three years and an additional 40 days after his resurrection, and after fulfilling all prophecies of the first coming, only few men and women came to believe. God never forces anyone to believe. In the messianic times, there will be sin. It is not the eternal state yet when there will be no sacrifice at all and there will be no sin at all. So the millennium is not sin free. It will be there. Sin will be there to a smaller degree, but sin will be present. In fact, I just want to bring to you that those many prophecies describing the era of the millennium or the messianic age. By the way, I use both terms. They speak of a time still with many conflicts. For instance, in Psalm 2, we read that the Messiah will, ro will rule with a rod of iron, meaning that peace will still need to be enforced because rebellion will still exist. So far, Yeshua never ruled over the nations. He will in the messianic times. We read in the last chapter of Zechariah as well, which speaks of, the, of this millennium, that those nations who will not keep the Feast of Tabernacles and not come up to Jerusalem on that day to worship the Lord will not receive rain but plagues instead. We often confound the, the, the messianic times with heaven, but they are very different. Peter actually puts the millennium time period within the time frame of the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is a term designating a time of judgment on sin. This is why at the end of the millennium, as, as far as concerning 2 Peter 3.10, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be birthed, giving way to the eternal state. Then God will erase every shadow of sin. Another and last question uh, along the same line is when, why, why the reinstatement of the mosaic temple system during the millennium? This millennial temple will not be the reinstitution of the mosaic law. Both systems are similar, but they are different. For instance, in the temple area, the holy in the holy place, the, there's no candlestick. 
The light of the candlesticks represents the present presence of the Holy Spirit with the believer and their absence may indicate that the law of the Lord will be in the heart of every believer as Jeremiah 31 prophesied. There will be no, no showbread, table of showbread, for Yeshua will be there providing for every man, yet many will still reject him. There will be no veil separating the Holy of Holies from the you know, for Yeshua, that is, will be present, yet many still will still reject him. There will be no high priest. Yeshua will be there. And see how hard man's heart can be. All of these things makes us appreciate all the more God's grace and the miracle of salvation. As for the Feast of Israel, only two are mentioned. Two are mentioned. There will not be the Feast of First Fruit, for Yeshua is resurrected and present there. There will not be the Feast of Pentecost, for the Bride of the Messiah will already be at home in the New Jerusalem. There will not be the Feast of Trumpets, for the resurrection of all believers would have already taken place by then. There will not be Yom Kippur, for the nation and Israel would have been judged by then. But there will be the Feast of Passover, to remind the people of the death of the Lamb of God. And there will be the Feast of Tabernacles, to remind the people of the great blessings of being in Yeshua, a blessing they would be enjoying at the time. Yet not all ends will, will come to a saving knowledge of Yeshua. It seems that the whole period, by the way, of time it is mainly there to show us the power of sin because in spite of the visible manifestation of the King of Kings' presence and, and authority during this time, people still will not come to faith. 